I'm a bit obsessed by scaphoid fractures and uh, Carlos, thank you for asking me to talk about them. Uh, much of this is opinionated and my opinions, but it's based on experiments I've done over the years and contributions uh, from many people. Uh, I'm not covering the whole of scaphoids because I thought some of you would want to go to bed tonight. So we're not dealing with uh, non-union. I'm not actually talking about malunion of acute fractures because actually I, with the severity of malunion you usually see if you can measure it, I don't think it matters. And these are the what I want to cover, which is the management of suspected scaphoid fractures, how we can prevent missing scaphoid fractures, and then the management of scaphoid fractures. The standard management of a suspected scaphoid fracture in the UK is still the, uh, basically scaphoid series x-rays on presentation. If you can't, if clinically there is a scaphoid fracture, but you can't see one on x-ray, you put them in a plaster or a wrist splint and bring them back for a clinical reassessment and re-x-ray in two weeks. The alternatives which uh, the powerful advocates are of doing an MRR, MR scan or CT scan, uh, which no doubt, undoubtedly will clear, more clearly show scaphoid fractures. MR has been reported as having 100% sensitivity for diagnosing scaphoid fractures, but that's because it's always used as the gold standard against which everything else is compared. And against that, CT is apparently not so good at detecting acute scaphoid fractures but I'm quite happy to use it and reliant on it, mainly because in Nottingham, we're fortunate that we can get CT scans of the scaphoid done while a patient is in clinic, just as we can getting a plain x-ray. We don't have to book them in advance. We can order it in clinic and they can be back in half an hour with the result. And we're not at that stage with MR scans at the moment, uh, particularly not in the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis, where I think the waiting list for any, for most MRI scans is now very long uh, months. Uh, but both, I think, have their uses. MRI, the scaphoid fracture, scaphoid will light up like a light bulb and it can't really be missed. With CT scan, I suppose movement of the wrist during the scan could distort the images and prevent a fracture being seen. But the question is, if you do an MRI or CT scan, when on earth would you do it? Would you do it at presentation in the A&E department? That would need an awful lot of uh, organization because it'd be, have to be 24 hours. Or at the two week assessment uh, after the, patient, the suspected scaphoids have been distilled down into those which are still clinically suspect, suspicious of a scaphoid fracture and therefore you would have to do yes, uh, do less of them. And would it be cost beneficial? Uh, we just don't know at the moment about that. I've looked with colleagues around the UK, a group called the BSSH Suspected Scaphoid Study Group, at the management, at what goes on with suspected scaphoid fractures at the present in the UK. By present, I mean 2018. And any member of this study group may be thinking, why on earth has Davis not published yet on this as we did all the hard work? And I must admit, I'm behind with this and I apologize. But anyway, in our 20 centers, we got a thousand suspected scaphoid, uh, scaphoid fractures to analyze. 54% were in men and 46% were in women. And of those, 114 scaphoid fractures were found within those, of which 60% were men and 40% women. Now the typical sex distribution of fra these fractures is at least 80-20. Uh, and I think is more likely 90% men, 10% women. So this does query whether all these fractures which were seen were actually acute scaphoid fractures. And I don't know for sure, but I do know that if you're uncertain whether you've got a scaphoid fracture or not at a two week assessment, the simplest way to treat them is to put them in plaster for a further period and treat them as a scaphoid fracture. And I also know that however, the harder you look at any set of scaphoid series x-rays, the easier it is to hallucinate a scaphoid fracture. I've done it many a time. 
So 114 scaphoid fractures were diagnosed, but we can't say with confidence that they were all actual scaphoid fractures. And the sex distribution makes me think that probably there were some which weren't in there. As far as we know, none were missed. Uh, as we had a minimum fo follow-up of four months, but some late may have presented later as scaphoid fractures which were missed and as non-union. But we gave patients four months to come back if they had problems. The majority of suspected scaphoid fractures uh, were converted to scaphoid fractures if a scaphoid fracture was was thought to be present at the first clinic visit, which is usually two weeks, uh, more another 20% at the second, and then all which were diagnosed were diagnosed by the third clinic assessment. And the times of these will vary. But as a blatant rule of thumb, which I use, if you can't see a scaphoid fracture on scaphoid series x-rays at four weeks, then there is no scaphoid fracture which will develop a non-union if taken out of plaster and mobilized. And this is because I think if you can't see it at the four week x-rays, it must have been an undisplaced fracture. And in my opinion, undisplaced fractures only take four weeks to unite if truly undisplaced. The caveat which would bother me, which bothers me about this statement is the dreaded proximal pole fractures. Uh, but I think they would be seen at four weeks if they were there. So an awful lot of hard work went in to differentiate these thousand sus suspected fractures into acute definite fractures or su the 114 definite fractures and the ones which weren't. Took 1,780 extra sets of plain x-rays, 116 CT scans were actually performed in this group and 248 MR scans. And the MR scans were predominantly performed at just a few units quite uh, quite generously in many of the cases, whereas in others, other centres, no CT, uh, MRIs or CT scans were performed. We worked out on a rough basis of costing that it cost a quarter of a million to sort out the, to find these 114 fractures, uh, which is 2,000 odd pounds per fracture, but that the estimates of costs are very difficult to work out. The question is would MR scanning every suspected scaphoid fracture be more cost effective and reduce the number of missed fractures or are we actually getting them all this way in a way which is cheaper than MRI scanning them all? Uh, it may be less, effect, uh, less patient friendly but what, is the benefit to MR and the strong provoc provocatance of the saying that the MRI scans uh, will reduce the number of missed fractures and speed up the system. So, will MRI scans reduce the number of missed scaphoid fractures? Well, yes, if all scaphoid fractures presenting to the emergency department are either diagnosed as an acute scaphoid fracture, in which case the MR scan is unnecessary, or a scaphoid, a suspected scaphoid fracture. So we need to know, are scaphoid fractures missed uh, because the scaph suspected scaphoid fractures are not, uh, that acute, the acute scaphoid fractures are all not distinguished from soft tissue injuries mimicking suspected scaphoid fractures. So we need to know why are scaphoid fractures missed? And to do, look at this first, I and a, a trainee in uh, Nottingham Jamjoon looked at 52 litigation cases which I'd looked at of missed scaphoid fractures. And the beauty of looking at these litigation cases is that when I'm asked to comment on them, I get sent every single hospital record, every single GP note, and all the x-rays which were ever taken. I, so I have the complete set of data on what was going on with these scaphoid fractures. And we looked at the 52, and what I can say is that in none of them was a wrist injury masked by other injuries. There weren't multiple injuries and the wrist was ignored. They all came in with reporting wrist pain. Look at the sex ratio, 90% male, 10% female, very different to the suspected scaphoid group. 
and the majority were of the waste and uh, of, about a quarter were of the proximal pole as defined in this uh, in this in this study which is in the proximal 20 percent of the scaphoid so what did we find on the clinical examination the highlights or not highlights was that in 71 percent nobody looked for scaphoid tenderness in 89 percent nobody looked for thumb compression they did the thumb compression test and i have to confess that i personally would be one of those because that's not a test i normally do but I always look for scaphoid tenderness. So looking at that, going further, of the 52 cases, what x-rays were taken? 13 had no x-rays because it was just thought to be a soft tissue injury. Standard PA and lateral views only were taken in 29. AP lateral and an oblique view in seven and in only three were scaphoid series x-rays taken, which means that really there was only a suspicion of a scaphoid fracture in three of these 52 cases, which went through emergency departments. And many were discharged without follow-up. So an early MRI scan or CT scan of this group in the emergency department would have only identified three of 52 missed fractures because if you didn't become a suspect, the other 49 did never, beca never became suspected scaphoid fractures. So they never entered the, uh, got the entrance ticket to have an MRI scan. What is required, and this isn't supposed to be derogatory of emergency department staff, is further training and basically that in every wrist injury, you have to look for signs of an acute scaphoid fracture and actually to avoid negligence, record it in the notes. But even then I think proximal pole fractures are likely to be missed because they frequently present with no tenderness in the anatomical stuff box, but tenderness dorsoradially over the wrist, uh, uh, on, as that is where the proximal pole of the scaphoid lies. It is a, it's a scaphoid basically lies at 45 degrees to the angle of the, uh, the axis of the arm. So MRI would not really have helped in these litigation cases. To look further at this, I looked at a group of 657 acute uh, scaphoid fracture non-unions, which were collected by another group of BSSH uh, associates mainly, the Scaphoid Non-Union Research Group of which we have, I'm glad to say, published papers, but we haven't published this one. And this actually looked at how the scaphoid fr fracture non-union developed and looked what went on with the acute scaphoid fracture to see how, how, how the non-union developed, whether it was misfortune or, mis uh, or what. And you see about half of them presented uh, over four weeks, that's that lot, and tw or 12 weeks after the injury. Now, that's not, we can do nothing about that in hospital because those were people who'd injured their wrist and just thought it was a sprain. But about half of them don't come in time to really be treated as an acute fracture and develop non-unions. And those will be difficult to avoid and certainly MRI, you're not going to have an MRI by the sports, uh, by the side of the rugby pitch taking pictures. I believe that the majority of scaphoid fractures treated, which start treatment within four weeks, will unite with non-operative treatment. And certainly those detected within two weeks should unite with non-operative treatment, the majority 85% or more. So let's look at those who presented within two weeks of injury to see if they fail to unite through misfortune or because of problems. And I'm afraid this says it all. Of the scaphoid fractures which presented with wrist pain within two weeks of injury, only, just, uh, only 172 started treatment, appropriate treatment for a scaphoid fracture, plaster treatment or surgical fixation, whatever, within two weeks. 16 started, a further 16 started within four weeks. But then look at these, 
37% of them, 113, didn't actually start treatment within four weeks. Some of those would have been due to patients uh, thinking they'd got better and failing to attend follow-up appointments, but some uh, occurred because the fracture was missed. It wasn't recognized when they first presented. So this isn't just a case of those seeking litigation. It is also others who attend emergency departments who are having their fractures missed. And so it is quite a problem. So to reduce the risk of non-union, rather than just concentrating on MRI scanning, those who've been granted the privilege of being a suspected scaphoid fracture, you've got to go back further. And you could say there should be greater awareness of scaphoid fractures amongst the population, but the population has got enough else to think about. But maybe increased in awareness at sport clubs might be useful, but that would be very difficult. And you'll find that I think if this was actually worked that you got greater awareness, we'd be inundated with wrist injuries, or you know, the emergency departments are more than presently, of which many won't be scaphoid fractures, but some will be. But I think everybody's got to have a greater level of suspicion that all risks for X-rays could be a scaphoid fracture. It's not just the emergency department staff who've got to deal with all sorts of other problems as well, but also the fracture clinic staff and some of these uh, suspected scaphoid fractures were seen in the fracture clinic and considered to not to be scaphoid fractures. It wasn't just the emergency department. And I have to confess that I accept it is easy to miss a scaphoid fracture. I have more than once and I hope you'll all think he's only missed two during his career by the way I've said that. I know how many I have. So when thinking about treatment of scaphoid fractures, uh, they're the subtypes. And I like to divide the scaphoid into the middle 60% of the waist and the distal pole and the proximal pole being uh, the distal and proximal 20%. Because I think uh, it's really the proximal 20% which start behaving differently to the waist fractures. As to frequency, the proximal pole overall in acute fractures is about 5%, 1 in 20, but they're the most difficult to find. The waist are about 90%, and the distal pole, which almost always heal, are 5%. But with the proximal pole fractures, I believe, and I may be wrong, that the smaller the proximal fragment, the greater the risk of non-union. So therefore, the outcome of a fracture at the junction of the waist and the proximal pole isn't that much different from a waist fracture. But if you go down so it's in the distal 10, the proximal 10%, the prognosis becomes much worse. So I don't think all proximal pole fractures are the same. I think the smaller they are, the more difficult they are, the, more, the, the worse the prognosis in terms of union. But there's very little written about proximal poles because they're so rare, pole fractures, because they're so rare compared to the waist fractures. This is a really old slide of mine, just saying if I have a low tendency to fixing proximal pole fractures because they have a greater risk of non-union. And also, if they do develop a non-union, I believe that with the particularly small fragments, they are far more difficult to treat and get to unite than the bigger fragments, the waist fractures. And that's showing an open fixation, which I think I would still do if it was a displaced proximal pole fracture, which I certainly would treat operatively. Uh, just showing that's a screw going up. That shows how old I am. That is not a cannulated screw. And therefore it was great relief. I saw the check x-rays to actually seeing it crossing the fracture. Uh, you, if you've never, used an uncannulated screw to fix the scaphoid, you won't realize what an advance cannulated screws were in the treatment of these injuries. They were a game changer. However, with the waist fractures, and that's all I'm talking about now, waist fractures, uh, they're different. And I firmly believe that treatment for six to 12 weeks in a below elbow plaster cast will result in union of over 85% of these fractures. 
you do not have to immobilize the thumb, in my view, uh, as in a standard scaphoid fracture, a below elbow plaster uh, without involvement of the thumb is just as adequate and it lets you do a bit more while you're in plaster. However, it's become increasingly fashionable over the past 25 years to treat these acute waist fractures operatively. People say it's patient friendly. There's less time in plaster. But the question is, does it actually improve the union rate? It's claimed it does. Does it have a complication rate? Of course it does, everything does. And is it cost effective? And uh, it has to be cost effective, I think, if you're having a nationally funded uh, NHS, particularly when you've given out hundreds of billions to support a coronavirus epidemic as we have. It's got to be proven worth. Those people who phaser operative fixation will argue that conservative treatment is bad because it's got a 15% or so failure rate and uh, therefore those non creating non-unions. Those who like plaster immobilization will accuse those who like operative treatment of saying that 85% of the operations they do are unnecessary because those fractures would have healed already. And that's a dichotomy which is difficult to resolve. But it could be resolved if a surgeon could accurately predict which fractures would unite and which fractures would not unite if treated in plaster. And over the years, if you read textbooks uh, on hand surgery and greens, the following have been suggested as reason, as, as we predictors of whether a fracture uh, scaphoid fracture, waist fracture, will unite with non-operative treatment of not. Fracture type, whether by the Herbert classification or other classifications which look at whether the, there is a transverse fracture, an oblique fracture and such, have been suggested. Displacement has been suggested. Fracture comminution has been suggested. And proximal polar vascularity has been suggested suggesting that a vascular proximal poles due to the precarious blood supply of the scaphoid produce non-unions. So the first study I did to look at this was with Nicholas Barton, my colleague, and uh, Vikram Desai, who's now in, uh, in Mansfield as a consultant, was to look at fracture type displacement and comminution as assessed with scaphoid series x-rays affected the union rate. And we collected uh, or found retrospectively 151 acute scaphoid fractures, which had been treated non-operatively in plaster for eight to 12 weeks and had been followed up for six months. So we had x-rays at six months showing whether they had united or not united fairly convincingly. And in that we found the, we, that group, there was about an, there was an 89% union rate. What was happened then was all the initial scaphoid series x-rays of these patients were collected and their identity details were masked on the x-rays. The x-rays were then given to observer one who had no idea whose x-rays they were and no knowledge so was totally blinded and assessed the x-rays for fracture type, displacement, comminution and his overall view of the likelihood of union and he looked at all the scaphoid series x-rays as shown here. And then observer two, who was older and wiser than observer one, uh, that wasn't me, I was observer one, that was Nicholas Barton, also did the same and made his view on fracture type, displacement, comminution and likelihood of union in, in all of them. And what we both found was that flaxer classification however you measured, whichever one you used, had no effect on the union rate. Fracture displacement also had no effect on the union rate, and neither did the presence of fracture comminution. Furthermore, neither of our overall looking at the fracture and deciding whether it was going to unite or not feelings about the fracture, none of those affected, predicted, accurately predicted the union rate. We were not good at predicting which ones would unite or not. So nothing we measured on these x-rays predicted union. <laughs> 
So what on earth determines union? Outcome. Well, we next looked at proximal fragment blood flow to see if that determined the union rate. Now you can measure fairly, uh, get a measure of blood flow in the proximal pole of the scaphoid by doing a gadolinium enhanced MRI scan, where during an MRI scan, you inject gadolinium into a vein and measure its uptake in the proximal pole. And here you can see on the left, a very black proximal pole because it hasn't taken up gadolinium and it's not enhanced. So that's a pretty avascular proximal pole as a, uh, as a consequence of the fracture. And on the right, you see the proximal pole has lit up very nicely and that's enhanced showing that gadolinium has got in there and that scaphoid fracture has got a good blood flow. So you would expect the fracture on the right where you've got an enhanced proximal pole to unite and the one on the left where it had, was, had a poor blood flow, there was no enhancement proximally to have failed to unite. And if you measure the uptake of gadolinium or the up change in enhancement of the proximal pole over a period of time, you'll find it increases and goes up to a top level. It gives you a maximum extraction rate, which is a measure of the blood flow, and also the steepest slow curve. Both of these are measures of the blood flow to the scaphoid, not linear, but a, a view of what the scaphoid proximal pole blood flow is. So we did this study and we got acute scaphoid fractures, recruited them, and they all underwent a dynamic MR scan at seven to 14 days with ganolinium enhancement. The treating surgeons went and told the result of that test and all these fractures were treated in plaster for eight weeks. They had a CT scan to assess union at 12 weeks. So what happened is we got 32 adults. There were 32 scaphoid waist fractures of which 28 united, four failed to unite, so about an 80% union rate. And this slide shows the measure of blood flow in the proximal and distal poles of the scaphoid. Enhancement is a measure of blood flow. So the fractures down at the bottom here have very poor blood supply in the proximal pole well, the ones up here, like these three up here, they've got good blood supply. And basically the higher up the, uh, this graph they are, the closer to the top 400, the better the proximal pole blood flow. Going out along the x-axis gives you the distal pole blood flow, but don't worry about that. We're only concentrating on the proximal pole blood flow. Now looking at that, these were the ones with poor proximal blood flow, proximal pole blood flow, and six of them looked as if they had no uptake of gadolinium at all, and therefore appeared to be virtually avascular. So this is where you would expect to see the non-unions if proximal pole blood flow affected the union rate. What we found was this. These are the four which failed to unite. And it is, well, it's not cooked. These really were <laughs> these three with the best proximal pole blood flow developed non-unions and one of them with a fairly poor blood flow failed to unite. So from this, it just does not look as if proximal pole blood flow is the major determinant of what determines whether a scaphoid fracture unites or not, which is quite good news because if you had to do gadolinium enhanced MRI scans on patients to predict outcome, that would be quite unpleasant for patients and quite time consuming. Just to enhance this, this is a proximal pole of an acute scaphoid fracture here, and it hasn't enhanced, no blood flow. There's a CT scan at 12 weeks. You can argue there's some sclerosis there, suggesting it's had an avascular period, but it's united. Here's the one which lit up like a light bulb with the scaphoid fracture here, and here's the CT scan at, uh, uh, at 12 weeks, a non-union. So it is not the proximal pole blood flow. And I don't believe that proximal pearl blood flow causes scaphoid fracture non-union. All, all the six with avascular proximal pearls actually united. So what on earth causes fracture non-union? <laughs>
Well, we've looked at fracture type and level, displacement, comminution, and proximal pole vascularity and found nothing. But if you look at these scaphoid series x-rays, with experience and time, you will realize that that's a displaced fracture and it looks pretty badly displaced, but it takes a lot to work out. If you get a CT or MRI scan of it, it's blatantly obvious that it's a displaced fracture and more displaced than you might have thought. Here you can see it's a, there's a been palmer shift of the distal pole and about 70 degrees angulation. And on that view of it, which is slightly different, it's the same fracture, looks like 90 degree angulation. It's blatantly obvious, and you may think that's never going to unite. Uh, and I was very careful earlier to say that displacement and comminution, as shown on scaphoid series x-rays, did not correlate with the union rate. But the next question is, does imaging, does imaging with MRI or CT scanning uh, predict the union rate? And to highlight that, we did a study where we had a load of MRI scans, we didn't have enough CT scans at the time, and compared measurements of displacement, how display, dis, assessed displacement on them, and complained, compared it with assessments of the radiographs of the same scaphoid fractures uh, to see how the correlation of displacement between MRI scanning and scaphoid series X-rays uh, compared. And it wasn't good. If you look at this, uh, basically the x-rays, three of nine of the displaced fractures were detected. So six were myths, giving the x-rays a sensitivity of 0.33, not very good. And if you look at the uh, displaced fractures, uh, the x-rays thought there were seven displaced, uh, thought, sorry, thought four of the, un of the displaced fractures I'm getting terribly confused here. Uh, well, basically, I'm just going to say the positive predictive value was 0.43. It was not very good. And I must admit, I thought I'd worked this out when I had a run through the slides earlier. But I got confused. So does fracture displacement, as mentioned, measured by MRI scan, and it could have been CT scan, does that determine the union rate? And this was a further study we did. It's very similar to the others, 49 acute scaphoid fractures. Had an MR study at day seven to 14. We didn't do CT scans because we, we, they were less available at this particular time in Nottingham uh, without us paying for them. And uh, the MR quality is quite good. And here, I think you can see there's a bit of open, dorsal opening here uh, and a slight bit of angulation, that's what I'd call a moderately displaced rather than an undisplaced fracture. The results of the MR scan were not shown to the treating surgeons and all were treated in plaster for eight to 10 weeks. And then a union was assessed at 12 weeks by plain x-rays and if there was the doubt by CT scan. We'd looked at the MRI displacement uh, on all of these by two observers who were blinded for patient details or fracture outcome. So they both independently assessed whether they were displaced, minimally displaced or severely displaced, and they correlated well. There were 40 undisplaced or minimally displaced lines like this, where you can see there's no angulation, there's no step in the palmar cortex. There were seven moderately displaced where there's a step in the palmar cortex and some opening dorsally suggesting flexion. And there were two severely displaced where you can see this is totally off. That should be up there. And what did we find? On the MRI, if you compared MRI scanning assessment to union, all the 40 undisplaced ones united. Seven of the moderately dis uh, two of the seven moderately displaced ones failed to unite, and one of the two, God knows why the second one managed to unite, uh, failed to unite. And you get the magical figure we all search for, not just 0 0.05, but way a 0 0.01 for what it means. Uh, but this does suggest to me that displacement makes a difference. As we were blinded in this, we didn't cook it at all.
So in my opinion, acute scaphoid fractures cannot be predicted by measurement of proximal fragment blood flow or assessment of scaphoid series x-rays for whatever measure. But I think they can be or might be predicted by assessment of fracture displacement on MRI or CT scans. And could this be used to decide fracture treatment? Well, I think maybe it could. But seeing the results of that study made me think all these undisplaced scaphoid fractures healed the 40 in that last study. Are these benign injuries, which are really fairly harmless and quite easy to treat? But the problem has been in the past, we've never been able to differentiate them from the more displaced fractures, which are given the scaphoid a bad reputation. And I wondered about that and wondered if four weeks in plaster would be sufficient treatment for these undisplaced fractures. <coughs> so what did I do? What did we do? Well, John Geegan, who's now a consultant, led on this one. He's a consultant in Nottingham. We recruited acute scaphoid fractures, and this had full ethical committee approval. We all were treated in a below elbow plaster for four weeks. And then at four weeks, we did a CT scan on them. And the CT scans looked something like this. And this act one actually shows, you can see the fracture and you can see the sclerosis there, but there's no cystic change or anything actually to suggest that it's progressing to a non-union. But what we were looking at was not necessarily, did it look united on a four week CT scan because a fact, it's, it's difficult to know what determines when consolidation of a fracture will occur on a CT scan so that you can say it is definitely united. What we were looking at was displacement. And that to me looks like an absolutely undisplaced fracture. And we picked out the undisplaced fractures, mobilized them at four weeks, or at least we did when I was in clinic or a consultant was in clinic. Uh, and the displaced ones, we put the plaster in and kept them in for longer and they assess the outcome. And by longer, I mean eight to 12 weeks, no more than 12 weeks ever. We recruited 59 fractures and had, well, we recruited more than that, but we got sufficient follow-up. You try following up young men with scaphoid fractures, it's a nightmare. They all fail to attend clinic appointments when they think they're better. So you can't get a good X an X-ray to confirm union. And we got six non-unions and a, and of the, that, which is an 11% non-union rate, about typical. There were 43 undisplaced fractures, of which 26 came out of plaster at four weeks. The others were kept in for longer. And that was often when I was away from clinic or others were away from clinic and the trainees, and I don't blame them at all, just couldn't bring themselves to take a scaphoid fracture out of plaster at four weeks. And this is the problem, the scaphoid has this awful stigma about it that they do badly. So 17 didn't actually abide by, the, uh, by our treatment plan of coming out at, four, at five to eight weeks. And we'll come on to the, the displaced ones later. Of those in plaster uh, for four weeks, uh, 20, 25 of the 26 united, one didn't. And all of those in plaster for five to 17 weeks did unite. And every fracture clusters united on the four week CT scan actually united with strong significance. There's one which had united, no doubt about that. But the four week scan of the one which didn't unite is this one. And in retrospect, you could say that there were, it looks as if there'd been bone resorption there rather than the sclerotic rumors in the other one. And you could argue that we should never have taken that one out of plaster, but it's easy to say that in retrospect. We just didn't know, you know we had, we'd never seen a series of CT scans at four weeks, what to expect. And that was the one which went on to non-union. And now with those changes, I would not take it out of plaster at four weeks. So undisplaced fractures of the scaphoid, which is 66 to 80% of scaphoid fractures told waste proximal pole or ever, 
may just unite with four weeks in plaster. And if it's only four weeks, is there really any benefit to operative treatment? Well, that was the question I posed at the time, but since then we've had the SWIFT study, which was multi-center randomized controlled study comparing surgical fixation, often percutaneous versus cast immobilization of scaphoid waste fractures, uh, which were undisplaced or minimally displaced, which was basically undisplaced. And that showed no benefit to, to operative fixation of them, provided those which hadn't united at eight weeks with plaster treatment were treated quickly, I was going to say swiftly as a joke, uh, by, op by management of the delayed union, non-union with surgery, which and non-union surgery, that which isn't really non-union surgery at three months has a high success rate because of this non-union hasn't fully established. So that seemed a better policy <coughs> and non-operative treatment was more cost effective as well. And that was in SWIFT, you had to immobilize them for six weeks, whereas we actually reverted from immobil taking them out, most of them at four weeks to six weeks to be involved in this study. So I think for undisplaced fractures, there's very little argument to operative fixation in the majority of instances. We did, sorry. We did have displaced fractures and the, those were 20 to 34% of scaphoid, to all scaphoid fractures, the waste ones. And they have a, had a 70% union rate. Would there be a benefit of operative fixation for them? <coughs> well, maybe. And I think, yes, as in those, in this study, which I've just presented the displaced ones, we did a gap measurement on the back to measure the amount of displacement. We measured this gap in millimeters. And you know, they had a 70% union rate with treatment in plaster. So most of them still did okay, but could we distinguish those which didn't? Well, if you compare that gap to the union rate, you can see those with a gap of two millimeters or less all united. That was with about eight, six, six to eight weeks in plaster, eight weeks, I think, mainly. Whereas the gap was two to three millimetres, 50-50, and greater than three millimetres, the non-union rate went up. So that could be used as a determinant of prediction of non-union, those with more than three millimetres or of, of, not, of gap should maybe, there's a good case for fixing them operatively but they would have to be reduced and fixed, not just fixed. And these ones with less than two millimeters, they seem to be able to be treated quite safely in plaster, but not just for four weeks, a bit longer than that. We can't say that they had healed in four weeks and I doubt they would. So that's basically, that's, what's, that's what that's saying that less than two millimeters displacement likely to unite in plaster more than two millimeters, there's a high risk of non-union in plaster treatment. So putting that all together, you'll be glad to hear in the other end, with scaphoid waste fractures, I strongly recommend using CT scans. They take a lot of the, the uh, confusion out of the management of these fractures. And also they take an awful lot of confusion out of determining whether a fracture is united or not. I think if you've got 50% bridging bone at a scaphoid fracture, you can consider that united and it will go on to consolidate. And it may be 25% is enough, but 50% you can safely say is the fracture is united and will be fine. You don't expect a tibial shaft fracture to have complete united across 100% of the cross section before you start walking on it. Why should you have wait for 100% of a scaphoid fracture to cross union uh, cross-section to unite. So on the basis of that, I think you can put them as undisplaced and displaced. And this would be an early CT scan. There's no need to do it at four weeks. And I would propose to you, if you're feeling bold, the undisplaced ones treat non-operatively. I would suggest for four weeks, but if you're not so bold, go for six weeks. Uh, and it is scary when you start. If they're two millimeters or less, I think they can be adequately treated in a below elbow plaster for eight to 12 weeks. But if they're greater than three millimeters, or you could say greater than two millimeters, they need operative fixation. And if you were to adopt that policy, 
what you'd find is that 70% of scaphoid weights fractures you'd be treating in plaster for about four weeks. 12% of them would be in plaster for eight to 12 weeks. That's 82% of fractures. When you think about it, that's about the union rate for scaphoid waste fractures in most series, 85% and a bit more. And the operative fixation would only be required in 18%. So you would that would be one in five needing operative fixation. And I think that would be maybe, I think that would be cost effective, but the problem I'd warn you about is that those requiring operative fixation will be the difficult ones to fix and maybe can't be treated percutaneously because they're so displaced. As by this treatment option, you've taken away all the easy ones to treat operatively and have left because they will be treated quite okay non-operatively in plaster and just left with the nasty ones at the end. So that's all I was going to say. I haven't time to talk about malunion or discuss non-union, which are different subjects. That's a personal view of mine, but we do practice it in Nottingham, and I do believe it, uh, and I have confidence in it. But I'm quite happy for other people to do other studies to prove me wrong, and I'll applaud them. Thank you.